Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. Praise the Lord. Greetings to you all in Jesus' precious name. As we turn our Bibles uh, for this evening, let us look to the Lord uh, before we do so. We will also read two passages of scripture, um, one from Psalm 12. We will read the whole psalm responsively, just uh, eight verses in there. Then we will also read from Luke chapter 16, one more verse there before we go into God's word. Psalm 12, the whole psalm, we would read it responsively. And then we will also read one more verse in the Gospel of Luke as well. All right, Psalm 12, verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with my tongue we, we prevail and our lips are our own? Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sirings of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Verse 7. Thou shalt keep it them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side, when the vilest men are exalted. Let us also read Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 17. Luke chapter 16, verse 17. Let us read it all together. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Let us pray and look to the Lord, shall we? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for the highest privilege that you give to us to come to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to worship you, to adore you, and to acknowledge who you are, and also, Lord, to draw nigh, to be seated at your feet, to, Lord, receive from you the truths that are settled in heaven, eternal, that are infallible, that are pure, that remain, that endure forever. Lord, we thank you, we praise you for bringing each one of us, and uh, even as we look to you for your word this evening, unable and unworthy as I am to do anything here, Father, I pray that you would speak through me to me to each one of us this evening and that your word may be our foundation, 
your word may be lord our trust and uh, our hope forever father that uh, our lives would be built upon and that we would uh, stand firm lord to trusting your word at your face value at face value and and so lord living it out for the sure foundations of your word father may be our portion of our own foundations may be laid on it father we thank you we praise you lord uh, for giving us your word and uh, enabling us to behold the wondrous truths that uh, set us free that uh, give life to us and that are able to lord uh, preserve us in truth as well we thank you we praise you in jesus precious name we pray amen we are uh, continuing in uh, the sermon series of what we teach and i began last week to consider the authoritative and the god breathed word um when i was thinking about it i was thinking about what these words are in telugu as well because you don't have them so clearly and uh, easily said and and reminded and so i wanted to also reiterate that in telugu just for our reminder uh when we say authoritative uh i found two words in telugu translation app it says sadhikara adhikara purvaka and uh, god breathed word daiva veshapu vakyam sadhikara daiva veshapu vakyam that's the word that we have it is fully authoritative as the word speaks the word of god speaks it is god we speaking and not only that today we will look at uh, the infallible and inerrant word all these uh, aspects are the attributes of god's word as we began to look at these are the foundations of our faith um how and why we actually are able to believe uh all those emanate from what we know and understand the characteristics of god's word and so sometimes there are those in this world uh who question these things and who don't have these things clear which causes our lives not to have firm foundations but to be standing on slippery slope or even as we were sinking singing the sinking sand <laughs> as we were singing just now um so people live upon just any kind of foundations as as we see jesus himself giving that parable of one who is wise to build his house on a rock and those that are foolish that don't look forward for any storms but just go about building anyway right and so when we come to these attributes of god's word you and i are looking at the bedrock of foundations of why we believe what we believe and uh, we want to get this clear so that when storms come you and i would be able to anchor our hope upon these true attributes of god's word so much so that we would take god's word as face value we would trust the promises of god and that these promises would see us through the storms that we would face and so as i begin this evening about the infallible word of god i found it fitting to bring us to this quote by a w tozer who says god is not silent it is the nature of god to speak the second person of the holy trinity is called the word and he goes on to say the bible is the inevitable outcome of god's continuous speech it is infallible declaration of his mind when god has given us his word he has given his mind he has given us his thoughts to think god's thoughts after him so that you and i can not only think god's thoughts but begin to cultivate a practice of starting to think like him starting to understand his mind understand his heart so that our lives are built based on what his heart is so his heart's desire is and so when we come to this infallible word of god you and i have the 
treasure of God's heart with us so that our lives can be built upon what his thoughts, his plans, his heart is. And so when we come to the infallible word of God, here we just read Luke chapter 16, the, the thought of what Jesus thinks about God's word is crucial for us. When Jesus was upon this earth, he didn't think God's word is something that you have to come with a pinch of salt or you have to read carefully to just take the truth and not everything. But rather, he found that it is so reliable beyond our earth that we walk upon, the ground that we walk upon. We never even think that, I say this always about the infallibility and the reliability of God's word saying, when we are walking on the ground, we never think that this ground would open up and we would just be swallowed in down and, uh, oh, if I step now, am I going to fall into the earth? We never think that way. We take it for granted. I'm going to walk on solid ground as I come to church. That's what we think. And we walk. And the sky that we are upon, we never think what would fall upon me. Oh, if the satellites that are there or the sky, the meteors, all of these things, we never even have that doubt when we are walking under the sky. We enjoy the blue sky and then give God the glory. And more than this earth that you and I walk upon, more than this sky that you and I are, are under, God's word is much more reliable. That's what Jesus says as he was talking to the Jews here and the Pharisees who were questioning when Jesus said he's the son of God, they were questioning, how can you say son of God? And uh, there um, he is talking to these Pharisees and he says, you are covetous and as, as he is speaking to them, he says, you look forward for being esteemed high among men, but rather I am come, as he goes about to say, the law and the prophecies were until John, but the kingdom of God is being preached. As he was preaching the kingdom of God, he says, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass, but one tittle, not even, he's talking about the reliability of God's word, even to the dot and comma the punctuations of it, leave about every word or sentence. I mean, that is even more reliable, but even the punctuations of it, the pauses of it. If God's word has a pause, sometimes man's at nature is that he puts a question mark, right? <laughs> why are you wait? Why are you not answering me, God? Why are you making me to wait? And so he begins to put pick a big question mark. And Jesus says, even the title, that pause or the dot, when God puts a full stop, a man of God says, don't put a question mark. That's the end. That's period. That is settled. That's how God's word is. That heaven and earth would pass away, but not a title. Jesus had come when he had the word of God. As Matthew chapter 5 verse 16, he says that he has come to fulfill the law and not to destroy it. That's the that's the view of Jesus with regards to God's word. And so that's how reliable is the word of God. And so as we look at these two attributes today called the infallibility of God's word and the inerrancy, infallibility primarily focuses on, on uh, the nature of how God's word cannot even give an error or cannot fail basically. It is something that is so beyond failing. It is something so sure. It is something that is reliable. And so we looked at this in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and 11, such sure word. If you remember, we, we see that the word of God is like something that is sure to come to pass. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 onwards, Jesus, I mean, God's word talks about how high his thoughts are, how high his ways are than the ways of man. And then at the end, after that, in verse 10, after such high thoughts, we take note that such sure word that just as when the rain that is falling from the sky, as it is released from the sky, it has to come and fall on the ground. It doesn't go back up 
as oh did i come from the sky and am i to go down there is no doubt it comes down naturally because of the gravitational pull so is the surety of god's word that it has to come down and it has to be fulfilled and that's what the metaphor being given there the imagery given there is being shown to us of surety of god's word in isaiah 55 verse 10 for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but water the water at the earth and make it it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater verse 11 so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which i have pleased and shall prosper in the thing whereunto i sent it that is the surety of god's word such sure word we read that in second peter was chapter 1 verse 19 where uh, peter writes and says we have also a more sure word of prophecy it is sure settled oh peter was actually talking about his eye experience eye witness experience peter was there when jesus was transfigured on the mount of tabor and peter says many times we come to this uh, phrase that you and i hear as christians they would say if only i was there in the time when jesus was i would have believed everything i would have seen with my own eyes who jesus is and i would have believed every word that jesus says no peter says it is more sure to read god's word and believe than to be an eye witness account it seems than to be on the mount of transfiguration with jesus transfigured and showed his glory that's what peter was giving as a contrast when he says such sure word of prophecy oh I, you don't have to believe the story or the eye witness experience you have the word of god which is more sure and so we come to this infallible word of god which talks about the surety which talks about its fail lack of any failure on its behalf and so so the doctrine of the scriptures infallibility it speaks primarily because of the character of god our god is somebody who cannot fail our god he has never failed he will now never fail and that's why the word of god has that inherent character of not being able to fail and so jesus was talking to the jewish people uh, in john chapter 10 verse 35 where he says uh, there it was when jesus was saying that i am son of god i was mixing up with luke chapter 16 uh, but the truth is that as jesus was talking to the jewish people Ju- john chapter 10 verse 35 he says you err and you you err in your understanding because the word of god says you are gods and uh, how come when i say i am the son of god you are you are coming to stone me and there jesus says the scripture cannot be broken he tells a, a very at, important attribute about the scripture god's word is unbreakable it cannot fail it cannot be broken um the famous preacher said the story where a man wanted to go up the hill uh, sorry go up a tower and try to see if he can break the law of gravity and what he did is he jumps down from there and what <laughs> what happens is the result you know right <laughs> he ended up proving the law of gravity and breaking his back right that's usually how people who try to think god's word can be broken jesus says the scripture cannot be broken and time and time again uh, whoever puts a question mark to the word of god they come to prove that god's word is true and they break themselves many times uh, when we think about the scripture we need to recognize that the scripture has this inherent character this is dan brown uh, who wrote this uh, dan brown who wrote this da vinci code and he says the bible did not arrive by fax from heaven the bible is a product of man my dear not of god this is 
where his statement is the bible did not fall magically from the clouds man created it as as a historical record of tumultuous times and it has evolved through countless translations editions and revisions history has never had a definitive version of the book this is his version of what he thinks about the bible sadly only to uh, be be able to come to recognize that when god's word has has come to us as jesus says there are those who err because they misunderstand the bible they misunderstand the word of god and uh, and so when we come to these these attributes of god's word we are coming to the foundations of our faith and we are coming to recognize the very attribute of god because we come to a god who cannot lie we read in romans chapter 3 as paul was uh, talking to the to the roman church uh, the peop- the christians in rome he says in romans chapter 3 in verse 4 as he was talking about the advantage of jewish people as they have received the oracles of god he says in verse 4 let god be true but every man a liar the more they come to question the character of god the more they question the word of god they end up on the other side where they will prove themselves to be a liar and god would remain true that's what paul says here as he was dealing with can god unfaithfulness can god's unrighteousness be declared by man's unrighteousness no he says god forbid yea let god be true but every man a liar that will be the end of every man who questions god's truthfulness uh, we read true and true and true in titus chapter 1 verse 2 titus the epistle that paul wrote to titus he says in the hope of eternal life which god that cannot lie promised before the world began god is a god who cannot lie it is it is something that is impossible for him he is the truth he is the standard of truth and uh, he has given his word which is why in in john chapter 17 verse 17 we read jesus in his high priestly prayer he says sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth Jesus clarifies it so clearly and so many a times uh, we misunderstand the very attributes of god just like don brand may not be that we would go to say that bible is a manufactured book but we might not be believing to say god's word is infallible god's word is inerrant we might take only some parts that we like as god's word to be true but other parts we might just leave it aside that's a great danger that every christian can be lurking under which is why we need to come to affirm the in, infallibility and inerrancy of god's word and so oswald sanders in his quote he says our conscience our consciences are in, not infallible and they can become wrapped or weakened if not kept aligned to the infallible word of god meaning the way we judge is because of what our conscience says because of what our heart says and so when we come to even judge god's word at the limited knowledge or limited wisdom or limited experience that you and i have you and i are going to come to a a danger of of uh, being warped and weakened by the enemy of our soul wanting to take us for a ride and so when we come to this character of god in his infall character of god's word in its infallibility you and i are coming to prove that it cannot fail it cannot give an error uh, its very nature of remaining and enduring forever come with me to one last word on infallibility before we go to the inerrancy in first uh, peter chapter 1 verse 23 onwards we come to see the incorruptibleness of god's word first peter chapter 1 verse 23 what is it that makes us as christians what is it that has given us this rebirth and peter goes about to say being born again first peter chapter 1 verse 23 being born again 
not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever this this uh, vapor like beings that god had made have no lasting legacy but to live just for few years but to see that god's word would endure forever generations have come and gone and this word of god stands the test of time there are those who have come to question its uh, its authenticity and its authority and even its infallibility but they have passed away but this word of god remains and it transforms and continues to transform and sanctify people who bring themselves under it and such is the the very nature of its infallibility it is incorruptible it cannot be corrupted it would remain as we would read in the end uh, of that in verse 24 for all flesh is as grass and all glory of man is the flower of grass the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away but the word of the lord endureth forever who falls away like flower the man who questions the infallibility of god's word but the word of god it remains it endures it is infallible and so as we come to the infallibility of god's word we come to recognize that we need to align the our conscience to this infallible unfailing word of god so much so that our conscience would prick us of our failingness rather than any of the failure of god's word now come with me to psalm 12 as we are going to dwell in the rest of the time that we have upon this wonderful psalm psalm 12 is a psalm that contrasts the words of man versus words of god psalm 12 gives us a, a wonderful contrast of the words of man versus words of god there are three things about god's of man's words and three things about god's word as we walk through it psalm 12 verse 2 gives to us man's words are vanity man's words are like vapor they say today tomorrow they change it and that word is not the same they are vanity man's words are vanity man's words are flattery today they are going to say something about you and puff you up raise you up we read in uh, we have this famous saying in uh, telugu right mulla mulang mulang mulange mulage chettu mulage chettu yeah i forgot what chettu it is mulage chettu ante you can't even as you are going as you are going to push up to go up on that uh on that tree at least i have never seen a, uh that tree but the fact is the more you go up it's going to bring you down <laughs> basically you think you are climbing up a tree only to come down on the other side and you are on the ground such is the words of man when they praise you when they say you are it brother or you are it sister don't get anything about it and uh, that's man's word they don't have any ground they don't have any water they are but thin air you are going to have your feet be firmly kept in mid air only to be falling down to recognize how firm those words are man's words are vanity and flattery and haughty in verse 2 we read about flattery verse uh, verse 3 we read about both flattery and haughty they speak proud things they speak about oh how great they are or how great things they have done and that is the words of man even an atheist he comes and says how wise he is how how reasonable he is only to find himself before a reasonable god that he has no excuse as romans chapter 1 verse 19 says and so when we come to see man's words on contrast to such words of man which are vanity and flattery and haughty god's word are for the needy they need to come to see that they need the word of god oh today if there is one famine as we were doing the series in amos the last uh, sermon series that we had before 
we entered into the pandemic was that of Amos, uh, where there is a calling for a famine of God's word. And no wonder it is. There is such lack of only the words that people love to hear is abundant in, in all the online TV and other channels. The true word, the word that convicts sin, the word that penetrates deep and changes us inside out is so rare. And uh, we come to see that God's word is for the needy. Only when we recognize our need for the word of God, that's when God's word comes to us. God's word is for the needy. There are those who are being brought under the oppression as poor and needy people. And for them, God rises. He gives his word. God's word is for the needy. God's word is for safety. We read that he rises up in Psalm 12 verse 5. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety. For him that puffeth at him. There are those who are proud, who come to oppress the needy and the poor. But God rises up to give his word to give them safety. God's word is for the needy. God's word is for safety. But the greatest of all is in verse 6 that we read. The purity of God's word. This is what we come to as we consider the inerrancy of God's word. Psalm 12 we read verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth. Purified seven times. Such is the purity of God's word. That we can trust the pureness of God's word to know that there is, it is beyond error. The infallibility and inerrancy of God's word in Telugu, I just was writing it down. Tappanidi tappuleni vakyam. That's what the very attributes of God's word are. Even uh, in our memory verse, Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5, we read, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. If infallibility speaks about trustworthiness of God, being able to trust that he cannot fail and so I can believe him at his word and I can trust my life, my future, my eternity with uh, on his word, the inerrancy is going to give to us the truthfulness of scripture. The infallibility gives to us the trustworthiness of scripture. The inerrancy gives to us the truthfulness of scripture. It is beyond error. There is no room for error in the word of God. So pure it is. So true it is. That you and I can take it just as it is. You and I don't need to sanctify it anymore. It is already pure more than seven times. Such is the height of its purity. And so... When we come to God's word of its purity, of its inerrancy, you and I come to it to take it at face value. To know that this word is something that is so true that everyone else would remain false but not his word. And so as we think about this inerrancy, um, there are many seminaries and churches which don't subscribe, which don't uh, acknowledge the inerrancy of God's word. You know, the reason being, uh, there are those who rise up as skeptics to question. So many errors are there. There are, um, there are those that are there in God's word. How can you claim to have it be inerrant? The first thing that you and I need to recognize is the, f the phrase inerrancy stands for primarily the original autographs. That is, the original, um, the authors of the word of God. There are 40 different authors as we were reminded last week. And upon, on the span of 1500 years that God has given his word, his revelation. And it is by the spirit of God that the word of God was given to us. Men were moved by the Holy Ghost. And uh, it has dual authorship. It is actually written by a human author, but it was superseded that God has superintended that beyond their own 
error proning nature god had given his word that it would stay true and so we come to see that god's word is so true that uh, we can trust it norman geisler he says the inerrancy of scripture is foundational doctrine in which all other doctrines rest and the psalmist rightly says if the foundations be destroyed then what can the righteous do no wonder christianity sometimes we have shallow christians and uh, christians who don't grow and mature as we ought to because there is no depth of their trusting of god's word but rather just shallow beliefs and so um another man of god by name ray comfort he says to forsake the inerrancy of scripture is to snuff humanity's only candle of truth inerrancy is the ship's rudder the traveler's compass a lamp to our feet and a light to our path so true it is that the moment you and i say the scripture is not inerrant the only little light that they have which is the candle of truth it's no it's going to be not giving light anymore oh god's word also has error so i can also lead a little error is okay a little sin is okay and the devil needs only little compromises he doesn't need big big sins he just needs a little compromise to break our testimony and to have his ride he just takes us for a ride to become a weak christian and not be able to stand up for the truth and so as we consider this attribute of the inerrancy of god's word we see that so pure is his word and it is going to be for the needy and it is going to come for the safety from the work of the enemy when we think about the inerrancy of god's word um, it was in or around october 1978 that there was a council called the chicago council or statement on biblical inerrancy uh, that was formulated not that the church throughout the history had believed the inerrancy of god's word but there was a misunderstanding there were those because of the rise of uh, secularism and uh, the rise of um, all kinds of liberal theology um, there was a need for the evangelical church to stand up for the biblical inerrancy and so they have come to give a statement called the chicago statement of biblical inerrancy where uh, it was signed by many great uh, godly men um, some that you might know are jai packer rc sproul francis shafer john macarthur and uh, john james montgomery boys and all these great men of god about 200 of them evangelical leaders they had been through this process 1978 to 1986 to draft this statement on biblical inerrancy and uh, they have come out wonderfully to give to us that god's word in its original autographs although they no longer exist it is inerrant primarily because of the very nature of god uh, and uh, we're going to look at few that that are important from this this attribute of inerrancy inerrancy means simply without error there is no possibility of error because of the very nature of god there are three propositions that are given uh, to give some clarity on inerrancy meaning there are those who in based on the liberal theology or those that won't want to subscribe to inerrancy bring as uh, some causes as to why they don't believe and these are the things uh, but before that before we look at the objections i want to give three propositions uh, three propositions of inerrancy are these the bible can be inerrant and still speak in the ordinary language of everyday speech meaning just imagine a the psalmist writes and says the sun is rising up in the east right scientifically when a scientist comes and says oh the sun doesn't rise it is just the earth is rotating around the sun 
it is not just the sun, the earth is flat and the sun is rising and setting. That's not the case. Everybody knows that it is a language of poetry. A psalm is a poem, a psalm is a poetry. And in the poetic language, it is acceptable, it is possible and it is true that they give out their poems in the language of an observer rather than in the language of science. As a, as a meteorologist who comes upon the news every day, at the end of the news they would come and say, today the sunrise is so and so, the sunset is so and so, he is not scientifically wrong. Right? Nobody questions how oh, he is wrong scientifically, the sun does not rise. Right? Everybody accepts the fact that they get to see the sun rising. That is the observing language, not a scientific language. And so, when the Bible speaks an observing language, it is not to say that it is error. It is the language of the observer. So, that is a proposition of inerrancy. And even sometimes we might hear uh, some uh, some words in the Bible, some passages in the Bible say 800 people have died or 8000 people have died. That doesn't mean that there can't be 799 or 801, right? If that is how reporting is done, in general reporting as well, they would say when it comes to bigger numbers, they will just give a approximate number, 16,000 people have died. That doesn't mean exactly they everybody were counted, there were 16,000 dead bodies. It just at the scale of which the death has happened is what is reported, right? They just don't give 1,598 people have died. Nobody gives such reporting. And such is it with biblical authors as well. When they have given some observing language or reporting language, there are differences here and there, but that doesn't make the Bible be error uh, or, or in error, but it is still inerrant. And that's a proposition we need to understand. And we need to explain to those that are having difficulty to believe in the inerrancy. Now quickly, moving to the second one, the Bible can be inerrant and still include loose or free quotations. When you look at the Old Testament quotations being used in the New Testament, sometimes it might not be word to word exactly. It might be paraphrased, it might be different. And uh, today if somebody is to quote another person, they would begin with quotes, right? Now I quote and they say quotations and then they give out the word to word quote and say end quotations. That's one way of quoting somebody, but sometimes we, we don't have to quote everybody with quotes. We can paraphrase and say that President Biden had said everybody has to wear masks. I don't have to say exactly what the Biden president had said, right? I'm not erroring when I say President Biden had said everybody have to wear masks. I don't have to repeat exactly what he said. And that's also true about the Bible. The Bible can be inerrant and still include loose or free quotations. That's the language uh, liberty, not, uh, not to be stringent there. Now quickly, in the third proposition and then quickly I'll go to the objections and close. In the inner, in, it is consistent with, in, with inerrancy to have unusual or uncommon grammatical constructions in the Bible. You know, if you have ever wondered, the longest verse in the, in the New Testament is found in, uh, in Esther. Yeah, the uh, longest verse in the Old Testament is in Esther. I said New Testament in Greek actually, if you go, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1 to 14 is one verse. You have 14 verses, but Paul, actually not 1 to 14, but 4 to 14, I suppose, exactly. It is one verse. There was no break. They just, Paul was bursting forth in praise. He couldn't control and contain when he was thinking about the manifold mystery of God in the wonder that he wants to unite all things in Christ Jesus. And he has chosen before the foundations of the world and he has adopted you and me and has redeemed you and me by his precious blood. Can you and I pause when we are thinking about this grand work of God that applies to you and me and I am and you are part of it. 
Paul sometimes can't pause. Breathtaking. Such is the work of God that he even ignores all grammar to just give God praise. When a grammar is not important when it is to express our praise and emotion to God. That comes from the depth of our being. We just want to give our heart to God. That's the way praise is. So is Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, after writing Romans chapter 1 to chapter 11, he says at the end of it, Oh, the riches of the depth of the wisdom of God. So unsearchable are his ways. And he praises out and bursts out in doxology to this great grand God. What heights of his wisdom that he brings everyone to salvation to display his righteousness in spite of their unrighteousness. So this grammar breakage is not to say that Bible is error prone, but it is inherent. It is in keeping with the language that is acceptable. So these are three propositions and quickly I will go to small objections and then close which with the, the, the answers that we need to give. Three, three objections are uh, I was writing three objections, your honor, <laughs> just to say. But that is not to say the defense will be given as well. The Bible is only authoritative for faith and practice. Many who are liberals, they just would want to limit Bible only to their Sundays. But Mondays onwards, they want to believe what the scientist says. Oh, because the scientist says there are millions and billions of years, they want to believe that. Because... When you and I do that, what we are putting at stake is, we are putting scientists at an higher plane than God who cannot speak lie. And that's a very great danger. And that's what uh, the inerrancy argues for. It advocates, often prefers to say that the Bible is infallible, but there are those who hesitate to use the word inerrant. Because... When it comes to the creation narrative, they just would not want to give room but integrate with this theistic evolution to say, oh God might have made but it evolved or all these various kinds of subtle givens that there are there. But the more we do that, we are going to put God at a lower plane than a scientist who thinks and... Uh, Every time we come to a scientist or a PhD, you and I should know that there are those who know more and more about less and less is what uh, Steve used to remind, right? They know very little of all the depth, of all the width. They only know the depth of very small aspect. A physicist knows only one small aspect of the formula or some theory to such depth. But not everything. He doesn't know biology. He doesn't know geology. He doesn't know anthropology. Or he doesn't know archaeology. But we take him for granted. Oh, the physicist said, uh, who is that? Stephen Hawkins, right? He said, the universe is multi-universe. Because he said everybody regards him. Than God. And that's a grave danger. And now, the second objection is, uh, the term inerrancy is a poor term. People who make this second objection say that the term in inerrancy is too precise. I mean, they just don't want to say the Bible is so, so beyond error because there are some small number differences or that small grammar differences. And so they think it is too precise, too sharp to say Bible is inerrant. But the fact again is, the scholars who have used the term inerrancy have carefully drafted that they, it is primarily that for the original autographs, when God had moved men. Now, there are copies of copies of copies. Even in those copies, looking back and trying to go to the detailed copies and the textual variants. I mean, there are some textual variant, meaning if there are 5,000 copies, there are four or five or ten copies that might have different version of the word in the textual variant. But that doesn't give lenience to say the Bible is inherent. The fact is that God is true and when he has given his word to the original authors, he had given it without error. Copies can have errors. 
there was much persecution in the early church when the bible was being copied and uh, was being transmitted through copy error can come in transmission but not in the origin that's a key because the moment you ascribe error to the origin you and i are allowing error to a god who cannot lie who to a god who is always true quickly the third objection in close we have no inerrant manuscripts therefore talking about an inerrant bible is misleading this is the third objection that they have and the reason is that there is no original autographs right so why do you talk about inerrant autographs or inerrant bible the truth is we talk about it we stand to it because the more the the, the very time you and i give room for not letting god's word to be true this is what would happen i'll close with this which is in ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 the bible says that you and i are to be imitators of god you and i need to not have to reinvent the wheel of god or reinvent the wheel meaning you and i have not to kind of make up how christian life should be you and i just need to imitate christ or live like christ and uh, if god's word is not inerrant if god's word is having something that is not true then you and i are going to be given a license to say it's okay to lie here and there a little white lies are okay it is okay to not to be truthful always because god's word is not true anyway right and so begins our downfall or so begins our room for the enemy of our soul and he is called the father of lies and uh, from the beginning he has been a murderer he has no pa- no pity but longs to destroy those that have been made in his own image and redeemed and so going forward the last um, most important thing to take note if inerrancy is denied we begin to wonder if we can rely and trust god in anything he says we would we would not be able to trust god at anything or oh, if god has promised about eternal life is god has promised that in the much affliction he refines us he would see us through he'll be there you and i would doubt if he'll be there and that's a very great danger of not being able to trust god at his face value and quickly if we deny inerrancy we essentially make our own human minds a higher standard of truth than god's word itself we think that we can judge god's word but more importantly every man can be a liar but not his but not god and as as i close i want to bring us this wonderful quote by the dean uh, professor of religion in liberty school of religion he says this and uh, he does stand for inerrancy and he gives this wonderful quote he says no one defended the inerrancy of scriptures more than jesus he quoted biblical passages in responding to disciples that is his close counterparts when you and i talk to our loved ones it is worth living like jesus as he quoted biblical passages as though they are not inerrant he quoted biblical passages not only to his disciples but his critics that is in matthew 22 as he was talking to these jewish authorities he quoted the scriptures and to devil himself finally when the devil came jesus didn't use his magical power or anything but he used the power of the scriptures and he knew how the word of god is true and he referred to almost every controversial story in the old testament including noah jonah elijah elisha isaiah daniel he emphasized technical details of interpretation you know when god jesus was there he was interacting with these jewish people in psalm 110 verse 1 david says sit on my right side till all the enemies are brought into your footstool jesus actually questions the questioners and he says how is it david calls jesus or how it is david calls messiah as lord when messiah will be the son of david right and that question is to talk about the interpretation of god's word they were erroring in their interpretation of god's word jesus want to question their interpretation and that's why he begins to bring that 
truth of God's word that is true that he will be the son of David and he will be the lord of David too it was clarified later for us but for them they had clueless not even being able to answer or reconcile the scripture right so high is god's word that it is infinite in wisdom in dimension and so little of puny minds of ours question this infinite wise god and his word and so as the quote goes on to say in closing he emphasized the technical details of interpretation and dared to claim that the entire old testament message was all about him luke 2444 we are ultimately left with one or of two choices whether whether either we would say it is jesus who is poor and dumb in understanding or we would say it is those scholars who would say god's word is not inerrant who are poor and dumb and that in closing he says i'll stick with jesus every time i'll stick with jesus that he is true and every scholar is dumb or you would have to stick with those scholars who would say god's word is not inerrant and forsake jesus and such is the privilege that when you and i build our lives in the true inerrant infallible word of god our faith our our future our everything can be on a solid ground of god's word and not of any human imaginations so let's uh, ask the lord for his blessing on this word as uh, we have such a pure word such a true word that we are sanctified by that we are regenerated by that we are being blessed with to live our lives to trust our lives with and so let's ask the lord for his blessing upon his word loving heavenly father we thank you we praise you for enabling us to come together to consider how true how enduring how incorruptible is your word how pure is your word that is refined more than seven times as a silver father i thank you i praise you that you have blessed us with your own mind and your own heart your own thoughts to think your thoughts after you even as we have received your word father i pray that you would enable us to grow in faith to trust every word at face value to trust our lives to your living abiding eternal word that is ever settled in heaven that our lives would be built upon the solid rock or the foundation of your word rather than any human imagination we thank you we praise you help our consciences lord to be aligned to the your truth of your word that we may be preserved in safety from the error and the faults and the lies of the enemy thanking and praising you in jesus precious name we pray amen now may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of the father communion of holy spirit rest and abide with us both now and forever more amen